Up next on C-SPAN, a congressional hearing on community and immigrant health centers. The session takes place before the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Health and the Environment. meeting of the subcommittee will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to receive testimony on H.R. 4503, the Community and Migrant Health Center's Amendments of 1988. These two programs are the centerpiece of our nation's effort to provide primary health care to medically underserved areas. In conjunction with the National Health Service Corps, the Community and Migrant Center's programs are carefully targeted to reach the most vulnerable citizens who have little or no access to reasonably priced primary health care services. In addition to this basic role, it is the community and migrant health centers that the Congress has looked to when there has been a crisis with health care delivery. When unemployment was high and people lost their health insurance in 1983, when the numbers of homeless people began to rise, and when we saw little improvement in infant mortality rates, the Congress provided funds to community and migrant health centers to address the new health care needs. Now with the number of uninsured individuals and families rising to record levels, I believe it is imperative that we maintain and expand these two programs. Our purpose in introducing H.R. 4503 is to accomplish that objective. Our first uh, witness our first witness is from the administration. Dr. David Sunwall is the administrator of the Health Resources and Service Administration. Before I uh, recognize uh, Dr. Sunwall, I want to call on Congressman Tauke, a very distinguished member of our committee, for any comments he wishes to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, first I want to join you in welcoming Dr. Sunwall. I have the uh, privilege of serving uh, with uh, him uh, as a representative of uh, Secretary Bowen on the uh, Infant Mortality Commission. And uh, I've been uh, pleased to develop a good working relationship with him and look forward to uh, hearing his testimony today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, during the past uh, couple of years, I've had the opportunity to uh, serve as uh, co-chair of the Rural Health Coalition in Congress and as a member of that Infant Mortality Commission. And uh, in both capacities, I've uh, developed an awareness of the role of community and migrant health centers in meeting uh, pressing rural and maternal and child health needs. There are a lot of myths uh, that have been developed over the years uh, about uh, health care in rural areas. Uh, one myth is that uh, the health care in rural areas is better uh, because people in rural areas don't have the problems that people in urban areas do. Of course, the fact is that poverty is more prevalent in rural areas. Rural areas have 30 percent of the nation's population, but 38 percent of the nation's uh, poverty-stricken individuals. Uh, one in five rural residents in the United States lives in poverty. Poverty rates for the rural elderly are 75 percent higher than for all elderly in the United States. There are also, in rural areas, higher uh, rates of uninsured uh, citizens. Rural residents have a 15 percent higher rate uh, of uh, individuals who lack any form of health insurance uh, than the average in the U.S. as a whole. And rural residents have a 24 percent higher rate than their metropolitan counterparts of individuals who have no health insurance. There is also the myth that rural residents are somehow healthier than urban residents when uh, just the opposite is true. Uh, rural residents are generally engaged in very high-risk occupations, uh, such as farming, uh, timber, timber uh, work, uh, mining, and so on. And uh, the elderly who live in rural areas have more chronic disabling conditions, and the elderly comprise a very high percentage of the rural population. There are also, in rural areas, higher rates of infant mortality. Uh, despite the increasing number of uh, physicians and other health care professionals in the country, many rural areas continue to experience uh, severe shortages of uh, physicians and are running into problems in the delivery of basic health care services. Uh, there are also shortages of nurses and other allied uh, health professionals. 
Therefore, uh, in rural areas, uh, we often rely on community and migrant health centers uh, to ensure access to primary health care services. Those centers are on the front lines of uh, serving medically underserved areas. 60% uh, of the community and migrant health centers are located in the rural areas of the countries. And of individuals who are served in those centers, 60% are poor, 48% lack any health insurance coverage, over 30% are children under 14, and over 25% are women of childbearing age. That leads me to the conclusion that the senders are a very important part of ensuring that every American, urban and rural, has access to high quality, affordable, basic health care services. Uh, they are a key element in the nation's commitment to infant mortality and disability uh, reduction. And uh, therefore, I look forward to working with the chairman uh, to uh, swiftly reauthorize uh, this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tauke. Dr. Sunwall or Dr. Martin, we're pleased to welcome both of you to our hearing this morning. Your prepared statements will be uh, made part of the record in full. We'd like to ask you to proceed with your oral presentation to us. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm delighted to be here today along with Dr. Martin, who's uh, the director of the Bureau of Health Care Delivery of Assistance, which uh, runs these programs we're reauthorizing today. As members of this subcommittee know, community and migrant health centers provide prevention-oriented, comprehensive primary health care services to medically disadvantaged and underserved populations in their communities. A clinical team directs the delivery of services within a framework which recognizes that people progress through five stages of life, prenatal, pediatric, adolescent, adult, and geriatric. Last year, our community health centers delivered primary care services to approximately 5.5 million medically underserved people, the majority of them being poor and minorities. Community and migrant health centers uh, treatment focuses on the traditional health problems, but in addition, they give attention to new and emerging health problems, for example, the homeless, uh, persons with AIDS, and other serious uh, deficiencies in health. The Migrant Health Center programs makes grants which help support 122 health centers and an estimated 500,000 migrant and seasonal farm workers and their families are served annually. Among this group, about 50% are Hispanics, 35% black, 15% white, Asian, and other. The migrant health programs, in continuing to emphasize the coordination of federal, state, and local resources, effectively utilizes the resources given to them. They now have an environmental health strategy, which has recently been developed, to help them respond to the significant environmental conditions which affect the health of migrants. Our community and migrant health centers play a very important role in the department's efforts to address problems of infant mortality, which uh, Congressman Taki has referred to. Uh, specifically, for fiscal year 1988, $20 million of the Community and Migrant Health Center's appropriation was targeted to programs designed to reduce infant mortality. Of the total number of people served in these health centers, approximately 1.3 uh, million of them are women in childbearing years, many of whom require perinatal services. The Community and Migrant Health Centers are uniquely positioned to reach populations at risk for poor pregnancy outcomes. The grants are designed to reduce infant mortality, to reduce infant mortality, will be awarded to existing health centers to, to develop and expand perinatal systems, enhance the provision of primary and supplemental health services, and improve pregnant women's and infants' access to needed services. This will be done through case-managed, care-coordinated, comprehensive approaches, which will focus on the integration of the services available to women uh, throughout public, um, other public programs. We're trying to establish a baseline of information relating to current demand for perinatal services and develop a system to assure progress in improving maternal and infant health. Our community and migrant health centers have proven their cost effectiveness. We have uh, data which shows that these centers reduce habitual use of hospital emergency rooms. They can lower the total health care costs for recipients when compared to like groups not using community health centers and they have a beneficial and statistically significant effect on both white and black infant mortality rates. It is clear, however, that the different measures of success will be required to adequately evaluate the response of health centers to new and traditional populations at risk for poor health status. As part of an expanded focus for quality assurance activities, our community and migrant health centers will begin to move toward a system to track health outcome information in a longitudinal manner. With respect to the most recent version of your reauthorization proposal that is available to us, Mr. Chairman, 
We do support the three-year <coughs> extension of the Community and Migrant Health Programs. However, the authorization levels do exceed those in the President's 1989 budget. The President's fiscal year 89 budget requests $21 million for the infant mortality initiative, which I've described, and for other, uh, for other related health services, $44 million for migrant health centers activities and $400 million for community health centers. For fiscal years 90 and 91, we request such sums as necessary for the programs. Let me just take one minute and tell you what we do support in the legislation and commend you for including. We do support adding, quote, patient case management services, unquote, to the list of provided services. We do support providing grantees and other interested entities reasonable notice if the Secretary seeks to alter the service area designations. We do support adding appropriate health needs to the list of supplemental health services. We do support adding the requirement that fees be consistent with locally prevailing rates. We do support giving community and migrant health centers uh, the authority to expend federal funds on expansion of facilities. And we do support adding the requirement that in making grants to the Secretary, special consideration be given to the unique needs of frontier areas. In closing, let me just say we thank you for this opportunity to appear today. We commend you for your efforts to reauthorize this legislation and look forward to working with you to make sure our community and migrant health centers continue to meet the needs of the medically underserved. Be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Sunwall. I want to clarify the current funding situation for these two programs. My understanding is that for the current fiscal year, fiscal year 1988, the basic CHC program was cut by $17 million and an additional $19 million was added back for new infant mortality services. In the migrant program, the basic grant program was cut by $2 million and an additional $1 million was added back for new infant mortality services. While the overall level of grant funds is about the same because of the additional infant mortality money, it appears that both programs have suffered real cuts uh, from fiscal year 1987. Is that an accurate statement? Uh, yes, sir. There was a reduction from the Appropriations Committee, which uh, left us with somewhat of a shortfall. But I'd like Dr. Uh, Martin to uh, explain how we made the additions and uh, to continue the services that we were able to provide. Do you like to explain that? It, yes, sir. Uh, Would Mr. You be Chair, sure to turn your mic on. It. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. The additional infant mortality money, which was added, was added for a specific purpose for which it must be expended, and indeed in. Uh, testimony before both of the Appropriations Committee, we were asked and responded that that money will be protected specifically for the purposes of case managed care to a particular subpopulation within our health centers for about 150 to 175 centers. The subsequent action to, uh, as a part of the across the board reduction, which is the 4.26 percent, indeed did reduce the funding base of community health centers from 400 to uh, 382 million dollars. We testified before both the Senate and the House that we felt that the bulk of those cuts could be um, covered by essentially not refunding health centers that would be defunded in the normal processes by which we defund health centers. In previous years, we generally would refund health centers or find alternative grantees in those areas. Uh, the impact predominantly is going to be fe felt in simply not replacing those health centers. So in other words, with these, these cuts, what you've done is uh, reduce the funds uh, on some of the health centers that were, you were going to defund anyway. But what's the impact in the community uh, or the migrant health the program by defunding those centers? It will mean that for FY88, we don't anticipate funding alternative delivery systems in somewhere between 20 and 25 areas. So we are seeing cutbacks in the program. Yes, sir. Now, how are you using the infant mortality funds? Can you go ahead and describe that. Yes, sir. The, the um, procedure is to um, provide to centers which qualified, uh, qualify for a particular type of care to um, high-risk mothers and children. We estimate that will be about 200 to 225 centers with the appropriate obstetrical and nursing staff. They will be provided an opportunity to create a case-managed system of care whereby um, supported providers within the centers will be able to provide the full range of assured case management for 
the client or the mother and the family. That would include uh, w, uh, WIC, uh, agricultural um, uh, food supplements for the mother and the family. It would provide for necessary social services. And the purpose of the money is to pay for the individuals who will actually assume that assurance role. So essentially what you have is a primary care assurance provider who not only is assuring the medical care is provided, but the range of other available resources are brought to bear which are in the community. And we found very clearly and in fact in um, the, been much testimony for the, um, the committee that Congressman Tauke is on that it requires all of those services to make a serious reduction in morbidity or mortality associated with um, high-risk women. You selected 200 centers for we, this infant mortality funding? Mr. Chairman, we, somewhere between 200 to 225 centers are eligible. We have established a mechanism where we are having four regional conferences, and I think they've been held, with the grantees to explain exactly what we feel is needed for them to receive the funds. Uh, we would anticipate making awards to somewhere between 150 to 175 of those centers specifically for this activity. How many centers are there in the country? Uh, so about 650 community health centers and about 120 migrant health centers. Why are there only uh, 200 to 220 that are eligible? The, the expectation is that the, the centers who would be eligible are centers who have already in the previous high priority, and all health centers are expected to provide prenatal services. About 200 to 250 health centers have specifically augmented their staffs with specialized personnel, nurse midwives, nurse practitioners, obstetrician gynecologists to provide the, the entire comprehensive range of services. Those are the services, given the numbers of centers we can fund with only $20 million, that we wanted to prioritize. They have the basic um, capability intrinsically to assure the, the highest probability of success. They were also centers, in largest part, funded in areas with the highest infant mortality. For example, the centers in Mississippi and Alabama, I mean, we focused our previous funding in that respect on those particular centers in the first place. Um, so it's, it's really the next step in a continuing process of focusing on those populations at risk. So what you've done is take a um, $20 million sum and target it to those centers that have the capability of providing the prenatal care functions and maternal <coughs> child care functions and that serve the areas where there are the highest infant mortality rates. Yes, but I would assume that in selecting those, because of the limits of money, you left many others out that also serve a population with the high infant mortality higher than the national average. Is that an accurate statement? Yes, sir. So we, while we are spending more money to deal with infant mortality, we're not spending enough if we really wanted to get across the board to reach all the community that is now served by the health centers which are the primary, primary caregivers for many people in rural and underserved areas, particularly with populations that otherwise can't afford to go out and buy primary health care services for themselves? Well, within, within the constraints, of course, of the, of the budgetary considerations we face, we feel that this particular, and we have requested the money again, we feel this particular uh, level of resources is going to provide a very visible demonstration of our capabilities and I think that the overall resource constraints that we all face um, dictate the, the, the basic level of the, of the investment, although it is clearly a significant visible investment. Mr. Chairman, could I yes, just make one something. comment on that? <clears throat> I think it would be um, a mistake to assume that all of our efforts in infant mortality reduction are in this initiative. Clearly uh, in the $400 million that uh, the President is seeking, uh, a good part of that money goes to case managed care for women at risk of, of uh, having problems with um, um, a pregnancy. What we learned in this commission to reduce or to prevent infant mortality um, is that it really isn't the high technology medical care that's creating our problems in infant mortality. It's the insufficient case managed care and that's really what we're trying to, to expand. And uh, as I've learned from our experts in the maternal and child health program and been doing this for 75 years through the old Children's Bureau, uh, there's nothing new in what we know works. Uh, this kind of approach really does make a difference in the outcome of a pregnancy. So we're 
pleased to highlight that. There's no doubt it makes a difference. And the Institute of Medicine told us for every dollar we spend on prenatal care, we're going to save three dollars on health care for babies that will be born uh, low birth weight and with all the medical problems that accompany that. But if we have a nation of 37 million people without any health insurance coverage whatsoever, their access to health care is to a great extent going to be determined by the availability of a community health center or migrant health center to them. And if we are, uh, if we're really talking about uh, reducing infant mortality, not just showing that we can do it in a visible way, it's my belief that we're going to have to put a lot more money into these uh, centers or make these people eligible for insurance so they can go elsewhere and get access to the uh, primary care, not high tech, but just basic care uh, that, uh, that will be necessary to, to allow women to bear healthy children or as healthy as possible. Thank you very much, Great. Mr. Taki. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, perhaps we could uh, spend just a moment uh, uh, looking at the funding history uh, for these programs. Uh, in fiscal year 1988, we've seen a re reduction in funding from fiscal year 1987. I presume this is a result of the graham rudman cuts. Is that correct? That's correct. So these reductions that the chairman was talking about are graham rudman re uh, induced reductions. Without graham rudman we would have had steady funding, or would there have been an increase in funding? Would have been maintained, yes, sir. Would have been maintained. Suppose we go back to fiscal year 87, then, uh, and we uh, attempt to figure out how many people were being served, what level of service was being provided, and we wanted to maintain that same level for fiscal year 1989. What kind of funding level might we need in order to be able to maintain services uh, at the fiscal year 87 level and fiscal year 89? Well, we are seeking in the President's budget what I believe would do what you, you're uh, getting at, and that is we're seeking full funding or the full authorization level that we're allowed to seek under the law plus this infant mortality initiative. So it would be a total of some $421 million uh, that we're seeking to have funded. I believe that that would uh, not only enable us to maintain the level of service but also expand the care for women at risk of having a poor outcome pregnancy. In uh, fiscal year 87, we spent 400 million on the migrant health centers and, or I'm sorry, 400 million on the community health centers and 43 million on the migrant health centers. And that's the same as I understand it that the president is requesting for fiscal year 89. Um, and then with the addition, as you indicated, the infant mortality component. Uh, and do you think that the combination of those three would give us a, a level of services equivalent to what we had in fiscal year 87? Um, yeah, and as if I so, look at why, the, wh how can we get, I mean, I think it's great, but how can we get the same level of service for, let's say, 400 million in 89 that we got in 87? Um, careful management. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we're seeking the, the uh, 400 million, the 43 million for migrants, the 21 million, it would total 464 million in the, in the total funding for these activities. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it would certainly require careful management for us to serve the exact same number of people without let level me, of funding. Maybe let me rephrase it. You'd spend a little time with the chairman uh, suggesting that you had made cutbacks or exploring the reductions that had been made to meet the graham Redmond requirements. With the funding that you're requesting, would you be able to restore those cutbacks, restore what has been cut back? Dr. Martin? Yes, sir. And additionally, I think another component of the budget at least uh, has to be um, uh, presented to the committee, and, and we will submit a, a table for the record. But a large part of the expenditures in health centers are from other than our federal money. I mean, one of the big successes of health centers have been their ability to attract Medicare, Medicaid, Title, other uh, state and local money. And if you look at the aggregate expenditures, if you look at the aggregate expenditures in including those, uh, we anticipate that with the President's request we can return to at least the total numbers of people served in 1989 that we were serving in 1987. It, assuming a 30 or 40 million dollar increase in other resources available to centers in addition to the federal money. And we are seeing some uh, improvement in those other sources of funding that are available to the yes, centers. Yes, sir. Each year, each year those other sources have increased 
roughly equivalent to meeting the, the requirements for cost of living and other expenses that are increased in all health centers. What, what are those other sources, just to enlighten me? We, will, we can submit them for the record, but it includes uh, Title 18, Title 19, Title 20, which is administered through the block grant with the states, um, uh, private third parties or independent third parties, cash fees, um, patient fees, which in 1988, for example, are $95 million, um, state and local resources, including Title V and other state and local revenues, which are utilized with health centers. Do you get any of the homeless funds or the uh, AIDS uh, dollars coming into the uh, community and migrant health centers? Yes, sir. The, the homeless money, the homeless money was specifically provided um, on the health side through the health centers, and indeed the health centers administered that money as it had the jobs bill money. So this is just one of several pots then that the senders are drawing from if yes, you will. About half pots. of the funding is what we seek in this authorization or the authorizing monies with about half of their operating costs. Okay. In your testimony uh, you indicated uh, that uh, we have to respond to changing health needs I think is the way you put it. Uh, what kinds of changing health needs do you see over the next uh, three years and will they uh, what kind of impact do you think those changing health needs will have on the senders in their operation? Um, it, it's been clear that Congress turns to us, meaning the Health Resources and Services Administration, to meet the what are perceived as special populations whose health services are, are falling short, be that AIDS patients, uh, be that uh, the homeless. Um, we have uh, the ability through these community health centers to target those populations and then try and provide the care for them. As I project the needs, I think they're, they're in part from what uh, Congressman Waxman has referred to as the uh, difficulty with people obtaining health care because of either no insurance or underinsurance. And our community health centers have clearly been filling in part of that gap by being able to see people regardless of their ability to pay. So it's that underinsurance uh, or insufficient medical coverage coupled with specific uh, or these special populations in need that Congress identifies through the process of your hearings that I think we can serve through our community health centers. Uh, there was some discussion earlier about uh, the problem of data collection when it comes to uh, uh, infant mortality and the demand for perinatal services uh, and the effort to measure progress in uh, maternal uh, and infant health. Uh, do you anticipate using any of the funding for infant mortality on that data collection effort? Uh, it's a different budget than I'm seeking here, but our maternal and child health care program, um, again, we're seeking full funding for that, a $560 million authorization of funds. Uh, of that, 15% of that is set aside for SPRANS grants, uh, those, as you're well aware, those uh, special projects of regional and national significance. A lot of that is evaluation kind of uh, projects which do provide us data. Uh, I'm not aware of CHC money specifically devoted to data collection. Could you respond to that, Dr. Martin? Uh, yes, sir. The only, the only expenditure of funds that we uh, utilize under this statutory authority is to assure the level of reporting uh, that's required to document the effective, efficient, and quality use of the services. Specifically with this initiative, we anticipate not using traditional forms of reporting, nor are we going to create new reporting requirement. But it's very important for these health centers to be able to artic articulate for us qualitatively and quantitatively how they made an impact with what we estimate will be about 50,000 women. And that's very important to be able to show Congress what we did. And I understand that. I just didn't think it would be appropriate to use this limited amount of money for a broader data collection effort no. for, uh, relating to the health of uh, mothers and infants. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I might just take this opportunity to go on record as saying that, in general, I think we don't do enough health services research or data collection. Um, we spend enormous sums of money on basic science, and that's appropriate and fine, but uh, I feel periodically like we're working in the dark if we had more, a better understanding of how our funds are spent and, and uh, the services that we're providing, we, we could do more enlightened policy. And that's just my unsolicited comment. Why, uh, why is it you think we're not doing as much uh, research in that area as we should? 
Because I think, quite honestly, it's just not glamorous. Uh, Congress has never seen fit to uh, develop much effort to that. I believe that um, the uh, disease-oriented kinds of research or the pathology are more exciting or interesting to the general public. But I believe that we're now recognizing that uh, our health care system is kind of a bit out of control and we're spending a whole lot of money for things that we're questioning their efficacy. And uh, I, I think that's part of the answer. And how much did the administration ask for the function? I believe there's a health research, research on health services. National Center for Health Services Research. Yes. Uh, they have sought funding for um, uh, yeah, maintenance of what they've been given in the past, essentially. I believe it's a $20 million authorization. I can't recall. But it has been um, maintained as it was funded in the past. They also are seeking funding for some health services research and quality assurance through our agency, the Health Resources and Services Administration, where we hope to get $15 million appropriated for us to do some outcome studies and, and uh, determine what quality care really is. Well, I agree with you. We need to do more work in that area. and We'll work here to see if we can get some more funding and hope the administration will work with us to get more funding for that effort as well. Thank, thank you both. For Mr. Being Chairman, with yes. If, if you'll yield, I think our subcommittee has been fairly enlightened on that issue. It's the appropriations uh, committee if, uh, <laughs> that has, uh, where we have some work to do. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. We'll look forward to working with you on this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our uh, next two witnesses are Dr. Aaron Shirley, Executive Director of Jackson Hines Comprehensive Health Center from Jackson, Mississippi and Lynn Clothier, Executive Director, Indiana Health Centers, Inc., from Indianapolis, Indiana. <coughs> We're pleased to welcome the two of you to our subcommittee hearing this morning. Your prepared statements will be part of the record in full. We'd like to ask you to make your oral presentation to us and try to limit it to uh, no more than five minutes. Dr. Shirley, why don't we start with you? All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I. Uh, I am indeed grateful for this opportunity to, to come before you and the committee. Uh, I have submitted a written statement on behalf of the Nation, National Association of Community Health Centers, but I would like if you would uh, bear with me to deviate from that statement and share with you some of my personal experiences in providing primary care services to low-income residents in Mississippi. I'm a practicing pediatrician and also the director of the Jackson Hines Comprehensive Health Center in Jackson. Our center has been in operation since 1970. Since our inception, we have recognized the special needs of low-income families and individuals, and as such, realized the limitations of a traditional, strictly medical orientation in providing the care needed to impact on the discrepancy in health status between the poor and the non-poor. <coughs> Thus, our program has focused on more than just fee adjustments and physician availability to accommodate the poor. We know that we cannot just sit back and wait for patients possibly at highest risk to come and find us. We have thus devised innovative means of reaching those most in need. For instance, as a pediatrician, I have a special interest in the well-being of infants, children, and adolescents. After noticing a relatively small percentage of these groups, these age groups utilizing our facilities, we decided to take the services to where they were. The results have been a network of school-based clinics providing primary medical care on site in four senior high schools and two junior high schools. Renovations are currently on the way to establish a clinic in an elementary school. In addition, we have adopted five other elementary schools to provide the same services at our main clinic facility in Jackson. All of these schools have student populations in which 80 percent or above are from families living below the poverty level. This approach has impacted our program in two ways. First, we are serving 3,500 youngsters each from each year from the schools and a significant number of family members, infants, preschoolers, and others who are not in school, including pregnant women, as a direct result of increased community awareness of health through their school children's participation in our program. We've long had a concern for the lingering problems of infant mortality, especially the disparity which exists in the rates of white babies and black babies. 
This concern prompted us to establish within our clinic a perinatal program targeting at-risk pregnant women with special emphasis on early identification and enrollment for prenatal care. During the calendar year 1987, the first full year of our perinatal program, we provided prenatal care and delivery for 362 pregnant women. Of this number, 90% were teenagers and we had no infant deaths. We have also a special interest in the elderly population of our service area. Poor housing, inadequate nutrition contribute to the poor health and misery endured by so many of our elderly poor. Our concern for these conditions so prevalent in our community prompted our staff to seek non-health related resources to establish a feeding program serving 125 rural elderly, one nutritious meal five days a week, and an elderly housing com complex with 60 units adjacent to our clinic in Jackson. Now, how did this relate to your proposed legislation to re reauthorize community and migrant health centers? First of all, it serves to point out the uniqueness of community and migrant health centers and our ability to reach the truly needy with meaningful first-class health care designed not only to prevent and, treat, prevent and treat diseases, but to improve the overall quality of life in the process. Our problem now, as a result of our display of passion and competent medical skills, is the ever-increasing numbers of needed individuals seeking and using our services in face of dwindling resources. Between January 1st, 1981 and December 31st, 1987, the number of regular clinic users has increased at our facility from 10,000 to 48,000, a 380% increase. Over the same period of time, federal funding to provide these services has increased by only 12.5%. When we combine the federal funds with our increase in revenue from patient fees, Medicaid, and other sources, the overall increase in dollars available over that period has been only 26 percent. Even worse, funding for our clinic for the grant period beginning August 1st of this year is slated for a 14 percent decrease. This at a time when we project another 10 to 15 percent increase in persons seeking care at our facility. And gentlemen, in closing, through it all, up to now, we've never had to turn anyone away or reduce basic medical services. However, at the proposed reauthorization level, I'm afraid that we will eventually come to that. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions that you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shirley. Ms. Clothier? Good morning, Mr. Waxman, Mr. Talkie. Um, my name is Lynn Clothier. I'm a nurse practitioner, and for the previous 16 years, I have been involved in the provision of health care programs and services for the unserved and underserved residents of Indiana. This includes the Maternal and Child Health Program, the Title X Family Planning Program. I am currently the Executive Director of Indiana Health Centers, which operates a network of federally funded community, migrant, and homeless health centers and state-funded WIC centers in the state of Indiana. I'm pleased to be able to address you today. You've re received my written, written statement in advance. I'd like to digress a bit from that statement, and I will try to avoid duplication of earlier comments where possible. Since Dr. Shirley has spoken about the Community Health Center Program, I would like to focus my comments on our Migrant Health Center Program. As you know, the Migrant Health Centers provide very needed, needed health services for America's farm workers. We're providing those services from southern Texas and Florida to hard to reach labor camps in the Midwest and the Northwest and to remote rural areas on the eastern seaboard, among others. As a member of the National Association of Community Health Centers, I appreciate the opportunity to come here today and to tell you that it's very necessary that we reauthorize the Community and Migrant Health Center program. You know that the Migrant Health Center program supports public or private not-for-profit corporations such as myself, which are providing primary care. We pr currently have approximately 122 migrant health centers. Um, you heard Dr. Sunwall speak about the ethnicity of our patients. I'd like to add that 90 percent of our migrant farm worker patients are well below the federal poverty income guidelines, the and this presents a great financial barrier to them. 38% of our migrant farm worker patients are under the age of 14. 
55 percent are in the 15 to 64 year age group, but only 6 percent are 65 or older, as the average life expectancy of America's farm workers is still well below that for the rest of the population. 58 percent of our farm worker clients are female, 42 percent are male. And although the Migrant Health Center program funds contribute an average of 58 percent of the total cost of these centers, over the years we have been able to access Medicaid, Medicare, Title 20, and a variety of other programs. However, most migrant health center programs continue to have a great deal of difficulty in many areas of the country accessing entitlement programs for farm workers. Despite the actions of Congress, too many of the states fail to recognize migrants as residents of the state when they are clearly present for the purpose of employment. Too many of the states disqualify farm workers on the basis of income by failing to recognize that migrants are not employed for 52 weeks of the year, but by annualizing a few weeks of income and then declaring farm workers as wealthy and therefore not eligible for programs like Medicaid and food stamps. This factor alone makes continued migrant health center funding necessary to address the health needs of this population without whom our nation's crops would go unharvested. Respectfully, I would like to point out that much of the world position of the United States is predicated on our agricultural industry. Ironically, the people of the United States involved in the beginning of that chain, i.e. farm workers, are no better off than those at the end of the chain when our agricultural surpluses are shipped to third world countries. Indeed, those most experienced in the health care of farm workers refer to this population as America's third world. Since its inception in 1962, the Migrant Health Center program has responded to the unique needs of migrant farm workers. Because of the population's high mobility, linguistic, and cultural diversity, as well as their living and working in remote agricultural areas, migrant health centers have had to develop models of care that have been recognized by other health providers for their uniqueness and clinical sophistication. Right now, case management has become a real buzzword for all of us. Migrant health centers have been providing case management ever since they began. Um, this is absolutely necessary to find farm workers where they are to make sure that they take ad adequate use of all of our resources. Um, we spend a great deal of time arranging for inpatient services over great um, geographic areas. We've had to develop interclinic referral systems whereby medical information can be exchanged over thousands of miles. We've long had to be concerned about environmental protection and education as well as nutrition. I'm pleased to tell you that I believe that migrant health centers form the basis of the very high quality model that is appropriate for most of the, the difficult to reach populations in our country today. Particularly in my experience in Indiana, um, our model has served well. From our beginning in 1977 as a migrant health center program, we've been able to use that model to springboard it into full community health services for local unserved populations and recently have applied the migrant health care model to the homeless of Indiana. I'd like to speak to you just a bit about the increased need problem that we're having in the face of decreased funding. Migrant health centers, as I have said, have made a significant contribution in providing cost-effective and high-quality health care to impoverished families. The need to strengthen the capacity of these migrant health centers has grown very urgent in recent years with the large number of migrant families living in poverty and without health insurance and the estimated increase in legalized immigrants and special farm worker groups now eligible for health services under the recent Immigration Reform and Control Act. Despite the fact that there has been a dramatic increase in the number of the poor, the number of uninsured and new immigrants, funding for the Migrant Health Center program has not kept pace with this increased need or the rising cost of health care. For the current fiscal year, the Migrant Health Centers received actual funding cuts of nearly $2 million below the 1987 level. Just as it is true for the community health center programs, the loss of these funds means that substantial cuts in health services for the poor and uninsured farm workers will be unavoidable. We estimate that as many as 30,000 farm workers will lose access to care this year alone. Needless to say, such reductions are hardly appropriate in a program that even today serves less than one half of the migrant farm workers and less than one fifth of the seasonal farm workers in our country. 
As we all know, the unmet health care needs of today become the health care ca catastrophes of tomorrow. Unresolved health problems simply do not disappear by themselves. The meter is ticking, and the bill will come due eventually. Without adequate funding, we cannot assure either containment or reduction in the nation's astro astronomical and growing health care cost. As a clinician, I, for one, am personally sick and tired of repeatedly having to make the obvious choice of allocating our too scarce resources to the treatment of preventable illnesses simply because sufficient funds have not been made available to address both prevention and treatment at adequate levels. I'd like to, to cite a, speci a special case in point. With the reduction of resources in recent years, it has been necessary for all of us to place more emphasis on center-based clinical services and less emphasis on the supportive services of outreach and case management. This has been true in our program in Indiana in, as well. Unfortunately, in the summer of 1987, Indiana Health Centers delivered its very first premature migrant infant in three years. Broke our record. Um, the mother was a teenager. She lived in a camp about 20 miles from our center where we had board certified physicians that were bilingual and a, a vast array of resources. But we were unable, due to funding, to have sufficient outreach last summer. The Premature Infants Hospital Bill at Riley Hospital on IU Medical Center campus in Indianapolis was greater than $100,000. One additional outreach worker for our program for last summer would have cost just under $5,000. Permit me now to comment on the proposed reauthorizing legislation for the Community and Migrant Health Centers now before the committee. Um, let me note that I and my colleagues in the Migrant Health Centers are indeed pleased that the Senate Authorizing Committee, with broad and bipartisan support, has unanimously approved legislation which would reauthorize the Community Health Center Program at $500 million and the Migrant Health Center Program at $52.4 million for 1989. We're also pleased that the subcommittee is today considering legislation that will be similarly supportive of the migrant health centers. Um, the patient case management services, the migrant high impact notice, and the funds to reduce infant mortality are all very, very important. If there's a question left about the effectiveness of community and migrant health centers, I would like to tell you specifically that at one of our health centers in Indiana, over a course of two years, we reduce the infant mortality rate from greater than 18 to lower than 6, and we have held that rate for the last two years. Um, we are, of course, however, disappointed that your bill would authorize only $47.2 million for migrant health centers in 1989. That amount is considerably lower than the Senate's proposed authorizing level and would essentially allow only continuation of current services. While I appreciate the need for strong bipartisan support of this bill and the need for expeditious action, I am compelled to say, on behalf of the people we serve, and especially on behalf of the millions of farm workers that we do not serve, these funding levels are woefully inadequate. Um, although I want the record to show our strong disappointment, I assure you that the, myself, the National Association, are all committed to working with you to build a broad and bipartisan agreement. Thank you very much for this opportunity. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you very much, both of you, for your testimony. Let me ask you this question. Obviously, the resources are inadequate to take care of the needs of the patient, patients that you see. When you have to make cuts, where do you make your cuts? Are they in services for people who are sick, or are they in pre preventive care for those who are potentially going to be sick? Up until now, it has been basically uh, support services, outreach, transportation, <clears throat> social services, counseling, and the like. With the proposed levels of funding that we're looking at now, in our area, we're looking at basic services. Um, in, in addition to pre preventive care, we're going to have to start turning sick pe people away, people who have already become ill, who have walked in the door who need our services that we won't be able to, uh, to serve. I think in our system what will happen is the preventative services will go first because once you take on a patient and you find out that they have 
large number of chronic diseases, you're very much committed to continuing the care for that person. So I think what will happen is we will restrict the new patients coming in, which will tend to be the, the healthier ones. Eventually, we will just be tapped out in terms of the total number of people that, are, that we can see in any given day. The level of appropriations for 1988 is lower for the basic services offered by community and migrant health centers. How uh, has that reduction affected the services offered by the community and migrant health centers? In, in my program, our funding year began May 1. Um, we took um, approximately a $50,000 cut out of $850,000 for community and migrant health centers. And we're grappling right now with which pieces of our program will be eliminated. Um, I believe that we will wind up uh, cutting back some hours of services. We will uh, reduce our outreach services. And we will put a limit on the amount of x-rays, you know, special services that we will be able to pay for, which means that they will not get accomplished. How about for you, Dr. Shirley? One of the most uh, costly items in terms of uh, um, out-of-pocket expense for elderly people with chronic conditions is pharmaceutical cost. And we're at the point now of having to determine uh, whether we can continue uh, our pharmacy that provides those medications to those individuals at this point. In the long run, that'll cost somebody more money. It might not cost the, the $330, but it'll, it'll impact on hospitalization, Medicare expenses, and Medicare care and, and those areas. We've already cut out all of our outreach. Can you give us any report on how the infant mortality uh, program is working? It has uh, it's just in the planning or uh, implementation stages at this point, as I understand. And the, uh, the dollars uh, for the, the, the perinatal initiative, the infant mortality reduction, will be available beginning, I think, in, um, in October of this year. We, will, we are planning as one of the centers that's eligible for those funds to apply. But this will, uh, I don't think was pointed out, uh, these dollars are targeted for centers already providing perinatal care. And the dollars are not specifically designed to increase capacity. It's designed to improve the services that's already being provided. So those pregnant women who are not already being served or the numbers above the numbers that's already being served, they're still going to be left out. So if we're talking about a high infant mortality rate in this country, which is in fact shamefully high, we're not going to really <coughs> do much to reduce that infant mortality rate unless we reach more of these people. We've got to reach more. It's got to be broader than the designated centers that's, uh, that's proposed. Well, the thing that always strikes me is that members of Congress or the administration come up with an initiative, they put an inadequate amount of money in it, they say this is going to wipe out infant mortality, it takes a year or so before the funds ever reach the clinics or the programs that can dispense uh, those funds and use them effectively, but after all is said and done, they're inadequate. And the people that must be reached still aren't reached, I'm sure some good comes from it, but the infant mortality still uh, is going to continue to be on the rise in this country. It's like our, our uh, anti-drug initiatives the last several years. Mrs. Reagan said all we needed to do is say no. Congress said, well, let's put some money into it. The administration jumped on it and said, let's put some money into it. We put a lot of money into drugs one year, and the next year the administration said no more continued funding. Just let them live on what we gave them for last year. And of course, the the um, drug abuse problem is still uh, a terrible one and is probably just, uh, just as much in the increase as it was uh, when all that huffing and puffing started. Well, I, uh, I agree with you, Ms. Glozier, that these uh, numbers are quite low and we'll do what we can to increase them. Uh, I know you will. It's, uh, it's, it's really uh, short-sighted for this country uh, to decide that we can just cut back on the funds to continue the present level of services in order to reduce the deficit. The cut on this is so small in terms of the deficit numbers that we have to achieve, and yet the cut is so great in terms of the small budgets that you have to deal with. So it's, uh, it's mindless, it seems to me, to, to make the kind of cuts that we have had to make. 
and even if we had been able to keep pace with the program, the funds are not going to be adequate to deal with that patient population that you must try to, to serve. We're so certainly being penny wise and pound foolish, unfortunately, because the bill comes due for the lack of health care for the lack of adequate health care in this country today. It either comes due in terms of the high um, hospital bills for the premature infants. It comes due when a child is so anemic that they can't sit through school and get educated and become a contributing citizen. It comes due at some level. And right now, in my opinion, we're being penny wise and pound foolish. I understand, you know, the funding constraints, but um, this problem is not going to go away, and until it's adequately addressed, I guess we'll all be sitting here having this discussion on an annual basis. Thank you very much. Mr. Talkey? Well, first I want to uh, commend you, Ms. Clothier, is it? That's it's correct. Uh, for the uh, remarkable uh, record you've established on infant mortality, uh, having that kind of decline over a several year period is uh, really a great achievement and I think suggests that you're doing outstanding uh, work in your center. Uh, just a couple of uh, questions. First, uh, Dr. Shirley, we have uh, received a few scattered reports, anecdotal reports of senders uh, having to cut back on services, particularly in the uh, obstetrical area. Uh, because of liability problems. Have you run into that kind of situation? Well, either of you uh, run into that kind of problem? We, at this point, um, we've run into it indirectly in that the only carrier writing in our state has just uh, requested and was granted a 48% rate increase uh, in this premium. Compounding that, as you know, the National Health Service Corps is the provider primarily of our physicians, our obstetricians. Those obstetricians have a tendency to, to serve out their core obligation and leave. Uh, when they leave, uh, we are saddled with the liability of, of what is called tail-end insurance to cover what they might have left behind, uh, the possibility of lawsuits. Uh, that is beginning, since we're, we're new at this, and our docs, we have one doc now that's, that's preparing to leave. Uh, the projected tail end insurance for that doc is $73,000. That's not budgeted this year. So, whereas the, the carriers are, are continuing to write in our area, the, the premium is excessive, and as the docs come and leave, that's, that, that increases the burden. And at some point, We've, we'll have to decide whether we can continue to provide the, the, the care if we don't get additional resources to take care of the, uh, the insurance. In Alabama, I think the situation became so acute that most of the health center obstetricians are having to be retained as federal employees rather than as, as civilian employees so that they are covered by the federal government. The, the, the malpractice uh, situation in, uh, in Alabama is just that critical. So what percentage of your budget goes for liability insurance? Do you have any idea? Uh, but I'd have to do a little quick rough calculation. How much in dollar terms do you In terms of dollars, uh, with the latest increase, we're looking at about $260,000 overall for 11, 12 docs. And that doesn't uh, count the 74000 that you no, don't have that budgeted. doesn't count the... And what's your total budget for your health center? $2.5 million. So you're running somewhere in excess of 10% then going for liability. Right. What, about, uh, what about your center, Ms. Clothier? Um, Indiana is one of two malpractice controlled states um, that was set up under Dr. Bowen when he was governor. And we do not have very serious malpractice problems. Our premiums are not very big. However, they have gone up about six, seven hundred percent in the last couple of years. But I, we don't have a problem is what I'm telling you. Cause you we're you don't pay, the, do you have any idea how much you pay for malpractice insurance? Um, I pay... I know exactly. I would pay like $32,000 for um, 13 physicians, 
six nurse practitioners, 21 nurses in the corporation, which is just unheard of in today's market. So you're market. paying much less than yes. that Dr. Shirley is, obviously. Yes. A family practice physician who does full obstetrics for us costs us approximately $4,000 a year. Okay. The malpractice control situation is working in Indiana. Mm -hmm. You have um, expressed some concern about the funding levels, which it, it doesn't come as any surprise, obviously. And maybe this isn't a um, particularly insightful question, but when you, but I think it's important to have it clarified. When you talk about uh, needing additional money, suppose you got that additional money, would it be used to provide essentially the same services that you're now providing to more people? or would it be used to offer new services, or both? In our situation, we would do both. Um, the state of Indiana um, only, prov only has health centers to provide services to about 40,000 of the half a million people that are eligible at our centers should they be there. So the overwhelming need would be to establish additional centers for the people without any access. At the same time, because of what in essence has been serious reductions in funding for us over the last several years because the funding has not kept pace with the increasing number of poor and the increasing cost of providing health care in this country, we would need to put back some services that impact on our effectiveness. Having sufficient outreach workers for migrants, for example, um, obviously can save a lot of money if that's you know, done appropriately. Um, we have not given up our pharmacy program because as a clinician I refuse to tell somebody that they need penicillin and then not be able to make sure that they get that penicillin. But that, that program is not anywhere near sufficient enough. Um, so I'm, I'm just saying we have reduced some things over the years that need to be put back. But in Indiana the most overwhelming problem is that we're, we're reaching so few people uh, compared to the number that are eligible for the program. We're averaging about 7,000 new patients a year. So increases, uh, any increase would be used to accommodate those new patients, plus our facility and equipment are 18 years old. And we're going to be facing some very heavy equipment costs pretty soon. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shirley, one of the mm -hmm. members of our subcommittee that's the strongest supporter of the Community Health Centers program, and I think particularly because he's so familiar with your program, is Congressman Wayne Dowdy. He, as you know, is running for Senate and uh, couldn't be with us. He had to go out and campaign back home, but he wanted me to extend his greetings uh, to you. Uh, he has uh, told us that if we can get the Community Health Centers program around the country to do the kind of work you're doing in Mississippi, it's well worth the extra funding because you're really helping people in a very important fundamental way. So I wanted to extend his greetings to you. Let me tell both of you, you've helped us make the record for the other members of the subcommittee and members of the House and why this program needs to be continued and why the funding levels must be increased. And I thank you very much for it. That concludes our business for today and we stand adjourned. Later this month, House Speaker James Wright of Texas and Minority Leader Robert Michael of Illinois will address the American Society of Association Executives. C-SPAN will present those sessions on Friday, May 20th at 7 a.m. Eastern Time, 4 a.m. Pacific. Saturday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific Time, C-SPAN airs a weekly look at the news. We gather journalists and C-SPAN viewers for a 90-minute discussion of what's happened and how it may affect us all. Join us.